Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Kay, Kay Carradine, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters. We're delighted you're here this evening. And um, in my official paragraph, which is the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which is, encourages informed and active partic participation of citizens in government. There, we go, that's better. It influences public policy through education and advocacy. And this evening, um, you're in for a real treat. Christine Moffat, who's a league board member here in Goose, Goose Bay, and our natural resources chair, has worked with a team of people to put together this exciting program. So I'm going to let Christine introduce the estuary experts and tell you more about it. And if anyone needs voter registration materials, they're available in the lobby after the show. Thank you again for showing up and thank you to uh, an amazing team of, of folks that have helped put this together. Um, doing this presentation uh, is, is something that we have felt that is very important. Our, our goal here today is to really talk about um, what an estuary is and how it works, and we have some great speakers to help us do that today. Um, <clears throat> estuaries and, and the reason we're here today is to actually to, tr to try to understand our sense of place because this estuary is very important to to Oregon, to the coast, and to all of us that live here. So to start this presentation tonight, um, I've asked Ashley Anduki to provide an overview of something that she's worked with Rogue Climate uh, as a land acknowledgement. So Ashley. Thanks, Christine. Which I'll try not to knock over any more Christmas ornaments while I'm here. <laughs> Before we start the program, we want to acknowledge that today's events on the South Coast are on the ancestral homelands of many tribal nations, including the Coquel Indian Tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Umpqua, and Sayuslaw Indians, and the Confederated Tribes of the Slet Indians, among many others. The Coos Bay Estuary is specifically the homelands of the Hanas Coos, Miluk Coos, and Coquel peoples. The Hanas, Miluk, and Coquel communities have been stewards of the surrounding lands and waters of the Coos Bay Estuary since time immemorial. And we must recognize that many of these communities were forcibly displaced from the Coos Bay Estuary. Through colonization, the Coos Bay Estuary has been an area of extraction impacting the natural and cultural resources that indigenous communities depend on. Over several generations, through acts of restoration, tribal nations, including the Coquel Indian Tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lurumpa, and Zayusla Indians, and the Confederated Tribes of the Slit Indians continue to be stewards of the Coos Bay Estuary today. We encourage you to learn about these rich, diverse cultures of the tribal nations that have called the Coos Bay Estuary home since time immemorial, as well as their sovereignty and governments in their own words. We know that land acknowledgments are only as meaningful as the commitment to stand in solidarity and in action with indigenous people for land back and sovereignty of indigenous peoples. Many here tonight are committed to working to ensure that we learn from these cultures, respect indigenous sovereignty, and work in partnership with tribal nations and indigenous communities to achieve climate justice and so much more. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also recognize an event that happened on Saturday with the Chief of the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians. That passed away 
Dog Slider was a friend of mine and a friend of many of you here. This tribute was written by his two sons. And um, we are here today because of some of the work that he did working with us to explain um, the role of the tribal nations in the estuary and working tirelessly to educate all of us about the importance of the estuary. So today we are going to be dividing these presentations up. We're calling it a panel. They're fairly short presentations. Um, and I'm going to give you a general introduction to, this, to a, a little bit of the subject matter. And then we have some, some very um, competent scientists and, and uh, residents of our community that will bring us into the picture of, of the importance of this sense of place to all of us and, and to our community. And so um, at the end of this presentation, we, if we have time for sort of a wrap up, what we're going to do is, is, is talk to you about what's coming in the future where we have a chance as citizens to engage in um, how the estuary should be in the future. So th that's kind of the overview of where we're going tonight. And I'm going to start with my general introduction here. Many of you are not scientists and perhaps don't understand some of the terms. Um, I I'd like to thank Mike Graybill for helping me with some of these images that are, are the purpose of them is to sort of give you some of the words and, and the features of an estuary that we talk about um, <clears throat> in terms of how, how fresh water from the land comes to the ocean and the various features that can occur there um, that are shown here with the lower estuary, the upper estuary. Some of these features are really important and they're certainly part of our estuary here. Just a little history of the Coos Bay estuary. It is the largest estuary between the Columbia River and the San Francisco Bay. And the graphic here shows you um, the, the general features of that in terms of the depth of the water. Um, the different colors of the water show you the different depths. And then I, uh, we've, we're going to be talking about some of the history development here. And I'm giving you this graphic here that I'm still not sure how the pointer works. So um, if you look at time here on the axis with 1860 is when, um, if you're looking at what the, what the surface area of, of this estuary was, it's depicted here at the top of the screen in terms of uh, <coughs> square kilometers. Then you can follow through time that there's a precipitous decline from about 1910 to 1970 in terms of the area of that. And, and that is a, created from filling and, and, and uh, putting in uh, obstructions that prevent the fresh water from mixing with the ocean waters. And so you can see how much our estuary has changed over that time. And Steve Greif will be giving you a great presentation picture of, of those changes. And then here we are in the present here. And so what we see today is not what was there 170 years ago. And we, again, we have we have opportunities to engage and understand how it's functioning today. Some of the features of estuaries um, is as a mixing zone, you have fresh water coming in from the land, and depending upon the time of year, 
you're going to see some very different salinities. In this, in this particular graphic is, is a hydrological model at the top. If you look at the left of the screen is the ocean and the right of the screen is the fresh water. And you can see in February, for example, the blue colors indicate quite a bit of fresh water coming into the system and, and most, most of the fresh water by the mouth of the estuary is, is turned to, to higher salinity. As opposed to July, where we have very little runoff from the fresh water, you'll see the salinity plume coming in quite a ways into the estuary. <clears throat> These are all considered very dynamic systems. And what, what we were going to talk about tonight is to explain some of the dynamics of the things that go on and how the creatures that live there are adapted to those conditions. The other shout out that we again want to give um, to our, our, our local tribes is the importance in how the estuary was humanly used before Western development. And certainly it was a bountiful area that supplied not only great cultural values, but amazing amount of food uh, and, and materials that, that were part of all of their livelihoods. If you remember the graph that I showed you where 1970 looks like there was a lot of changes going on, what happened in Oregon is a really unique story. And personally, I was able to be in Oregon right about the time that some of this started happening with the bottle bill and with understanding that, that we had a role to play in how the land was managed and how to include public participation in that. And so this is, a, this is an important feature that's really unique to us in, in Oregon that we have all these uh, potential components of understanding land use, and there's, there are regulations in place that allow for public participation in determining how this is managed. Um, it, it's a great story, and it has been challenged, and even this year was, was heavily challenged with a number of ideas that, well, we're restricting development and, and how are we going to do this? So uh, we're bringing this into the, the picture because this is part of looking at the future as well. Um, some of the details of coastal zone management were also uh, nationally recognized at that time where the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration uh, put forth an opportunity to, to look for um, ways across the nation to have management plans for the coastal resources. And here's a little bit of the history of that, um, the Oregon Coastal Zone, and, and the importance of understanding the management and understanding the way, the process that works. So the, their, the depiction here is of the estuaries along the coast of Oregon, and I count them as 21, some people count them as 22. And each one of them, as you can see in the, in the, um, the call-outs there, they're designated either deep draft development, shallow draft development, conservation, or natural. And some of the estuaries have multiple uses, and that's certainly uh, the situation in Coos Bay. This graphic uh, you'll see again in the presentations. Uh, this is from the 1984 Estuary Management Plan, and each one of these colored zones represents um, a, a management unit that's declared that this can be used for conservation, this can be used for, for development, and so forth. It's a very complex complex network of, of value-laden um, determinations. And again, this was in 1984. 
So we're looking at a future that may be determining the different, different management units as a result of new information. And so that's what we're looking at tonight to bring us new information and explain um, how much more we know about how estuaries work than we did back in the, in the late 70s <coughs> when this was all put together. Um, some of the things that need to be considered in looking at the future are, are things that were really poorly understood uh, 40 years ago. And, and the emphasis on climate change and the emphasis on understanding sedimentation and uh, the, the intensity of storms that is occurring now. All of these components are things that we're, we're trying to bring up, the, bring people's knowledge up to date with those challenges that we're facing. So without um, any further um, to do, <laughs> I'm going to ask Steve to come up here and begin his history of the development of the estuary. Thank you. I'm going to try to sit down here. You don't need to see me. I'd rather you see the pictures. And I want to make sure I am looking at the screen too. I'm Steve Greif. Uh, former public school teacher at North Bend, uh, history teacher. I'm very much an amateur, uh, and I'm not much of a scientist, but uh, I do appreciate what we're doing here tonight. And uh, the Coos History Museum is a wonderful resource, and tonight you're going to see a lot of photos. When Christine asked me to make this presentation, I'm going to concentrate on the time period that she showed on the chart where the bay was getting developed in the 1860s until we are where we are today. And the museum has something like uh, 250,000 images in its collection. And since I'm down there a couple days a week, I'm pretty familiar with those images. So I think you'll enjoy seeing some of these tonight. And I'll go through them rather quickly. You know, the museum is right on the east side of the peninsula, and we're right on the bay. And in fact, our major theme and the name of our newsletter is Waterways, because we recognize that from the indigenous people to today, it's the, it's the one thing that connects all of our history, that the, the, the bays, the sloughs, the oceans, the rivers, the creeks, the, the whole water area is the common theme. And that's what you'll see when you come see our exhibits. And if you haven't come to the museum, I encourage you to please come and support us. We think it's an important part of the culture of this area. If you ever see at the bottom right-hand corner here, I think, yeah, this works. So if you see this, it's just a reminder that this, this, this picture came from our collection. And that's one reason I'm doing this is I really want to I let you know that there's a resource in this community. If any scientists here wind up doing some sort of report and you need some visuals, come talk to us. <laughs> so I'm really glad that we started the evening acknowledging the people that have been here far longer than Euro-Americans. And this is a map that the tribal folks have created and let us uh, use from time to time in our presentations. All the triangles represent uh, some named and known villages in the area. And this is really what the bay and the area would have looked like up until around the early 1850s when a shipwreck on the North Spit, this is the North Spit, called the Captain Lincoln, uh, landed there and your Americans suddenly discovered there was a major resource here, a deep draft bay, um, signs of coal in the ground and timber that could be used for uh, shipbuilding. And so this bay became immediately a resource extraction zone, just like Christine talked about. The map on the left is one of the earliest ones I could find, 1856. It's a kind of a crudely drawn area, but it represents our bay. You should recognize most of the features here. You can certainly see the North Spit in this area, the opening of the bay. 
around where Pony Slough would be, and then our museum someday is going to be right there. Um, what's interesting is the notes underneath it that say the North Spit out here uh, is without forest, with identification of Empire, Coos River, Isthmus, and the mining camp of Randolph. But I want to come back to the North Spit not having forest on it. I want to talk about that a little bit. The map to the right is um, a few years later, 1856, there was United States Coastal Survey done. And the point we should make here is looking at what the mouth of the bay looks like. You'll notice that there seems to be some color here, some green indicating land, but then there's this sandbar here, and we don't see any jetties. And that's because there weren't any jetties here until the 1890s. So for the first, let's say, 40 years of Euro-American settlement here, there was a destruction at the, at the mouth of the bay and the water uh, flowed in and out in the, depending on the seasons um, in a natural way. But, um, and you'll see also there's hardly any development in, in 1865 empires on the map, but there's no North Bend, there's no Marshfield. All there is is a, a small uh, trail that's still designated today. It's called the, uh, 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 the Mill Tri Tribal Trail. It was uh, between two uh, lumber mills, one that Simpson owned on one end and one that Luce owned on the Empire end. And that trail can still be followed today, I think. All right, let's talk about jetties then. <clears throat> so um, vessels here were being built. There were something like 250 tall ships that were built by 1920 on Coos Bay and another quite a few more built on the and the Coquille River system and they were taking out lumber and coal to San Francisco but more and more the people that were living here the Euro-Americans were thinking that it was dangerous to cross that bar so they started talking about something Christine mentioned obstructions in the bay jetties and surprisingly the first jetty was not where you think it would be. It's not at the mouth of the river, but further up at a place called, today in Europe, it's called Fossil Point. And the, bay, the jetty jetted out like this. Here is a picture from our museum of its construction. Um, if you look carefully at the mouth of the North Spit, you'll see that it looks like there's all kinds of dashed lines here indicating at any given time Mariners didn't know where the entrance to the bay really was. And I think I've heard something about the fact that maybe at the mouth of the bay at low tide, it was as shallow as 12 feet. Well, that's pretty dangerous a crossing for people. Uh, things to point out here is there's um, a rock out here that's called Guano Rock, and I want to come back to that later. And this is another point you'll recognize, Coos Head, and you'll see this in some pictures coming up. But look how far in the spit is compared to where Coos Head is today, and we'll come back to that. Here's another really great picture, and on the left you can see Coos Head, and you can see that jetty I just described, the very first attempt to create a different flow at the mouth of Coos Bay. What's striking to me in this picture is if you look at North Spit, you can hardly see it. It's so flat and it's so little above sea level and there aren't any trees there. Today, if you took the picture from the same viewpoint on your way to Charleston, you could definitely see where North Spit ended and began and you could see a forest out there. But in, when this picture was taken in the 1880s, look how wide open the mouth of the bay looks. Pictures like this just help us understand where we've come from compared to where originally it had looked. By the 1890s, the federal government got involved and had a grant to start building jetties. The first jetty built was the North Jetty, and it essentially they had to build a railroad to dump the rocks from the quarries up from the Coos River. And they built these little cribs and they put the rocks in the cribs and dropped them in. And that controlled part of the entrance. Um, it was quite an engineering feat. And they say it probably doubled the depth 
of the entrance and exit to the bay. Went from 12 feet to 20, 20, 20 to 24 feet. A major uh, decision was made that we're all living with today, and that is that spit, the tip of the North Spit, the southern tip of the North Spit, you couldn't tell where it was. Well, they had to know where it was going to stay. And so they made a decision that they had to stabilize the dunes. So they investigated this, and they went to southern Kansas, where I think part of the Mississippi River maybe was there, and the Platte River and some other rivers. They went to Cape Cod, and they went to the Netherlands, and they, they were looking for a plant that could help stabilize the dunes. And I think it's, it, they wound up taking something called Holland grass. And I think its Latin name is kind of interesting. Arenaria, Arenaria, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's like the name is multiplied twice, and that's what this grass does. You put it in, and it just multiplies instantly. It was, it was perfect for what they wanted, but of course we all know it had amazing ecological impacts on the South Coast, and now there are groups that are, that are actually trying to take it out because we, need the, the, we realize the drifting sand means a whole lot to the ecology of this area. The official Jetty project engineer said, the reclamation of the great sand dunes on North Spit at Coos Bay is regarded as an important feature of the harbor improvement. So just note that happened in the 1890s. So now the sand is being stabilized by the 1890s and the entrance to the bay is being stabilized by the 1890s. Well, the South Spit, excuse me, the North Spit uh, had the North Jetty, and about uh, 20 or 30 years after that, the decisions were made, we need the South Jetty as well. So by the end of the 1920s, we have pictures at the museum showing that another railroad was constructed through Charleston, essentially, and uh, rocks were dropped for the South Jetty. And that had a major effect. We didn't have Bassendorf Beach until then. You know, sometimes we think the landforms we see today have always been there, but Bassendorf Beach isn't even 100 years old yet. I mean, there was some sand there, but the effect of the South Jetty, which you can clearly see over there, was to create another beach. Maybe there's pros and cons of that. High school kids you say there's a lot of pros to that beach being there. Um, others wonder if that was the right thing to do environmentally, but there it is. And that, it's just the fact that we have to deal with. So here's a, an aerial photo. Uh, once the two jetties are in, uh, you can see the North Jetty and the South Jetty have a lot of wave action, and they didn't hold up very well. They've been repaired several times, and in fact, I think as we speak, there's a, a grant out there to do some more repair. On this picture, um, you'll see the North Spit, though, has been stabilized. It doesn't have that look like on that early map. You can barely see Empire up here, and um, we've got the entrance that we recognize on the Spit today. And that guano rock that I showed you earlier that looks so far out to sea, it was actually right about here. And in 1948, they dynamited it. It was a rock that a lot of ships ran into. There were a lot of shipwrecks on the, on the bay. And this is a great picture showing the explosion that blew up Guano Rock. Here's an 1874 map. This is a little bit later now, we're in the 70s. And the squares you see here and the names on the peninsulas are donation land claims. So by, um, after the 1860s, the Homestead Act comes in and um, people are claiming plots of land and they're settling, and where do they settle first? The same place the natives settled, which is the, the most important land, you want to be near the water. And so you'll see this, it's the shoreline that have all the little squares. What you don't see are some things that we would recognize today. If you look carefully, and if you think about the graph that Christine showed you, about how things start to go down in terms of surface area. So I've just put some arrows here now of a, 
probably a 20 year old photograph, an aerial photograph of the bay. And you, if you look at the arrows, all these islands that you see, or the extra land down here in Empire, and the airport up here, and Pony Slough, when you compare that now to where the, all this, it's been filled in, obviously. Now, most of those islands in the bay are dredge spoils. So here's a dredge. There, we have a lot of pictures of dredges at the museum. Um, you can imagine. This one's in 1899. And they didn't, today, as I understand it, they often dredge and take the spoils all the way out the ocean and dump them somewhere. But in the 1880s and 90s and 1910s, what they're doing is they're dredging the channel and dumping it to create land where there was a semblance of low and high tide. If, if it was exposed at low tide, it was a good place to put dredge spoilings. So you see a giant pipe in that sixth picture on the right, and they're dumping uh, dredge spoils, creating more land. And this illustrates what the graph that Christine showed. This is a classic, and um, I want you to, to pay, look carefully and see if you even understand where this is. You go through this every day. In fact, you're sitting on it. You recognize where we are? I'll give you a clue. If you look carefully in the upper right-hand corner, you see the Chandler Hotel. This is downtown Coos Bay in 1912. This is 110 years ago. This is right where we are now, actually a little bit to the south. It goes up pretty much where the library is today, and all of us that live here know what the library is trying to do in terms of moving somewhere else because it's sinking. Um, look at how deep that slough was in 1912. That's the heart of today's Coos Bay. And the next picture is even more dramatic. This is taken from Telegraph Hill, looking south, down on the city, and there's the, there's the Chandler Hotel, and there's Marshfield High School, and there's essentially a major river at high tide going through here. The football field um, where they play soccer at Marshfield High School with the football field at Marshfield, the post office in Coos Bay, all of that would have been underwater in this picture. So this picture is taken around 1912-ish, 1914-ish, uh, I guess. Within a year or two after this picture, you're going to have that all gone. When this picture was taken, there were two towns here. Everything on the other side of that slough was called South Marshfield, and the other place was just called Marshfield. And there were bridges that had to be made over all those areas. No one was going to the environmental groups and asking for permission to do this. Um, in fact, they were quite proud. I, this picture says everything to me about what's happened on the bay. Watch Marshall grow. All the city fathers are out there, happy as clams, uh, no pun intended. 300 cubic yards an hour is being used to fill in Mill Slough. So there goes an entire tributary where salmon are trying to spawn. There are culverts, giant cul culverts under our area that we're sitting in up here um, that try to make up for some of that, but it, it, of course it doesn't work. Here's another, here's an aerial photo taken in 1929. By this time, think about the change from 1914 to 1929. Look at, you don't see anything about Mill Slough, do you? You just see city streets and businesses. But this picture I wanted to point out is what's happening over here in East Side. You see how all this has been contained now? There's a large ferry slip here, and there's one of the largest mills in the world at the time, the Coos Bay Lumber Company mill. And so you can see a lot of this has been now filled in, and they're anticipating the airport is going to go here. It didn't wind up being big enough for modern day planes, but um, that was um, another area that's been filled. So the channel has, has obviously been dramatically changed. 
This is a little bit further up Isthmus Slough. I'm going to pretty much stay on the lower estuary. But uh, this picture, that's Highway 101 today, and Coos Bay, I think, would be down here. But this is some mill activity and all the logs that are in log booms that are heading to the mills in this area. You can still see the boomsticks in the isthmus today. But pretty much this area here, you can tell, has all been changed, and that will go soon, it looks like, doesn't it? I mean, it's starting to get contained and probably is as of today if we had a comparison picture. Where the museum is today is what you're looking at in these pictures. In 1947, a group of uh, businessmen created the world's busiest lumber exporting dock. It's called Central Dock. The entire area from the museum, and I'll, I'll show you this next, that's the red square rectangle is where the museum is today. The blue is where the Coos Bay Village is today. That was all pretty much filled. There may have been a little bit of dry land that stuck out from Telegraph Hill underneath where the museum is today, but most of this has been filled. You can see the bulldozer in action here. And a funny story, Jim is here. Jim's the, one of the construction managers that helped build this museum. One of his guys that was drilling, piling one day, kathump, kathump, kathump. It went down an extra six feet, and he told me, I think we went through the top of a 1947 Chevy pickup. He, could, he was so good at his craft, he knew that he had hit something. Well, they just dumped everything there to create this property. And once again, there was no permitting for any kind of thing like this. They didn't even talk to the state about the fact that all the riparian areas are on the bay, really the state's property. And when you fill them in like this and create businesses, you owe the state school fund some money. When we built the museum, we had to go through quite a lengthy legal process to even get land title. In 2010, long after this was built, we had to clear the title with the state and pay the state some money to their school fund to build that museum. So once again, there's Highway 101. You go by it every day. Let's look at this next picture. It's, it's shocking as well. You're looking north. Can you even figure out where you are? Highway 101 would be this here. Coos Bay Toyota would be right here. The Red Lion would be right here. When you start looking at the land and now you are going, aha, and you realize, yeah, when I drive by there, everything to the west of Highway 101 is flat. It was water. It was part of the estuary. And that's all been filled in since the 1920s. Look at how much has changed. And Highway 101, of course, wasn't Highway 101 then. It was just a wooden bridge. Aren't pictures like this educational? History teaches us that there's, there's change, and we have to recognize that. Now, here's another extension of that. But now we're in North Bend, and we're looking up at Simpson Heights and the city of North Bend here. Lucinda, this is where the Mill Casino is today. <laughs> okay, so um, all of this is where Weyerhaeuser eventually will be, and the casino, and Highway 101 is roughly where this wooden bridge is. Um, pretty amazing, isn't it? Here's an aerial showing that. Uh, the Cruise and Banks shipyard was there before Weyerhaeuser. Cruise and Banks was there from the turn of the century to the 1940s, uh, Weyerhaeuser came in the 1950s, and the Mill Casino and the tribe uh, got control of the property in the late 80s, I believe. But what you're looking at is, try to remember the last picture, everything up to the edge of the hill would have been slew, and all the buildings you see and all that land would have been part of the estuary. I took a, a class once um, in the summer for what I was doing for my master's degree, and uh, it was a geography class, and this is a map I developed. I looked at some the 1926 shoreline and compared it in 2000 when I was going back to school 
what the difference was. So everything that you see in, in black ink or brown ink was the original or the 1926 shoreline, let's say, and by then even some of that was developed. But look at how much more is extended because of the red. You can definitely see up here the airport area and Pony Slough in this area and where Simpson Heights is under the bridge and out here at Jordan Cove. This is what North Bend looked like 100 years ago. Um, Sherman Avenue today would be kind of in this area here. Uh, this is 1903, the city, when, when Simpson began his city. But all this, of course, is Phil. The Menasha Log Yard you see now would be right about there today. So once again, pictures that illustrate the graph that Christine was trying to show us. Um, Pony Slough, I have um, two different pictures, one taken in 1930, one taken in, about the, in the 50s. Look at the arrow. The arrow was solid land in 1930, and you can see about what the airport did in terms of fill. That was a decision, economic decision that this community made. Pony Village the same way. Pony Village was, um, that slough was sold to a man for one dollar, and he started the Emporium and promised us in the 50s every town needed a mall. That was the big deal. So this is where the mall was. But these pictures show the mall being developed. And once again, the, the mud flats are being piped. That's North Bend High School. Uh, one of my colleagues who went to school in 1958, 59, said that was the last year he could skip school and fish right off the campus of North Bend High School. When the tide was high and salmon were running, he'd be out there. That was Tom Yonker, by the way. <laughs> Lucinda knows who I'm talking about. This is another great photo. So all that I just showed you in the last picture, all the mud came from here. This is Virginia. Look what, look what um, people have done to the slough. It's, it's highly channelized and controlled. And it has um, a, a gate right there, a, a, a fish gate right in that spot. There's North Bend High School again. But this is what happened within um, three or four years from the late 50s to the early 60s. This picture is looking west. Once again, towards Pony Village over here, this is Virginia. And since the last picture I showed you, all this has been filled in. You know, it's been filled in for 30 or 40 years and I see a sale pending sign on it, but nothing's been developed there. But that's where that is. But the thing I like about this picture is someday at low tide, um, get, a, get a viewpoint from here or as you're crossing of uh, Virginia, and look out here to a giant hole. Can you see the giant hole where my arrow is? That's left over from the dredging activity. That's, that's where they took it to create it. And you can see how much of the, of the uh, airport is exposed as well. And, the, and then down below, of course, this is the Menasha, was the Menasha Log Yard. I'm not sure which company owns that now. Um, <coughs> This is North Bend Middle School, which was constructed at about the same time as Pony Village, about 1959, 60, 61. And we always refer to this as a, as a coach. This is what's called the lower field. Does it look natural to you? <laughs> no, that's that highly, highly changed and ordered Pony Slough. And to create a, uh, an athletic field, the, the district filled that in. And we have to think about, I, I like what Christine said, she used the word obstructions. Besides jetties, think about how the ebb and flow of an estuary works when a highway and causeway is built like this. And of course, this picture is missing something, isn't it? The causeway out to Horsefall Beach. So this picture is probably in the, in the 50s, and then I think early 60s, they built the causeway to access the, the dunes. And Haynes Inlet would be to your right. But think about what that does to Haynes Inlet. I'm almost done. 
Um, a friend of mine, Bert Dunn from the Coquille Historical Society, made me aware of this map and he's donating it to the museum. This map, I don't know, there's no date on it, but I do recognize the highway bridge, the Bacullah Bridge right here. And this is Glasgow. It says Glasgow Town Site. And this is um, Kentucky Inlet. Oh, that's Kentucky Inlet. I'm sorry. And Couston is down here. Everywhere you see these little squares, or the, especially the colored ones, you know what someone's trying to do. This is probably in the 1950s. That's projected fill. This came from a real estate office that was closed that Bert helped clean out in Coquille. And he, he thought, I'd like to have this map. And I thought, wow. So if this had gone through, the Coos Bay Channel, even as we see it today, would have been this narrow thing right here. You, here's the museum down here, or roughly. You would have just been able to throw a rock over the channel and hit somebody's house from the museum. Uh, that, to me, is an amazing thing. Obviously, it hasn't come true. I don't think you could get permits to do this today, but it's the kind of thing that maybe that would have been developed before the land use planning that Christine talked about in the 1970s. That's an amazing map, isn't it? So this is my last slide. In, in her graph, there was a low point of 1970 and then a slight rise in the amount of water surface in the bay around that time. And maybe some other speakers will be talking about this. Two things that maybe made a change there. One is the Oregon Museum, Oregon Institute of Marine Biology had been around earlier than that. But it was really being um, active in conservation work by the late 60s, early 70s. Um, you know, Earth Day came in about 1972 or 73, and a lot more conservation was being considered. And then by 1974, the um, South Slough Estuary, the nation's first federally protected wetlands in terms of an estuary, was created to study what's going on in an estuary. And of course, that changed the course of maybe South Slough being developed the way it was. So now it's, it's recreational and educational. I'm sure other speakers will be talking about that. And thank you for your attention. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, my name is Jan Potter, and I'm retired from the University of Oregon's Institute of Marine Biology. And I'm going to showcase organizations in our community that help us understand the complexities of the Coos Estuary. Um, and in the short time I have, I am going to focus on organisms, uh, or not organism, organizations um, that undertake monitoring in the estuary, um, conduct science, educate us about the estuary, and act as estuarine advocates. Um, and I'm going to apologize in advance if I've omitted an important role of your favorite organization, but time constraints meant I had to make some decisions. Um, and uh, if I didn't get your organization's prime information, please don't worry too much. So let's start, I'm going to stand over here so I can see what I'm looking at. That way, no, that's not fair. Let's start um, with one of the larger groups that have helped us understand the estuary. And this is the South Sea National Estuarine Research Reserve, which we've just heard about. It's part of the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. And it will be 50 years old next year. Um, it, it does a lot of research on the estuary. It looks at stewardship and education of the estuary. And um, one of the interesting things that I discovered was this report, which shows that um, the South Slough Reserve each year contributes $6.1 million to our coastal economy. Uh, and in 2023, just this last summer, the South Slough Reserve uh, was given 3.5 million to further restore wetlands in the reserve. 
So it's definitely a large part in getting our estuary um, some exciting things happening there. Uh, the other thing that South Slough has is a friends group, uh, which supports the Slough um, and provides funding and education opportunities to the Slough. So the Slough does a lot of research. Uh, we've learned a lot about Coos Estuary because of the Slough. They do a lot of monitoring of the estuarine functions. Uh, they monitor fish populations, water quality, they do weather monitoring, um, they monitor invasive species like this green crab here. And most importantly, we have learned a lot about one of the most important uh, organisms in the estuary, eelgrass, um, and they monitor and have done much research on that, that plant. They also have developed um, multiple uh, research information about how to restore the estuary. You saw from Steve how we've actually de uh, degraded and made the estuary much smaller. Well, South Slough is actually making it bigger again. Um, and they do this by uh, learning about how to restore coastal wetlands. They've worked on restoring native oyster beds. And um, in the last few years, they have become very important in researching carbon storage in the estuary. Um, so a, a, a climate sort of adaptation um, piece of research. Along with researching the estuary, South Slough uh, does a vast amount of educating about the estuary. Um, they work with school groups, they work with the general public, they conduct um, summer science camps, they give guided tours and hikes, and they also give workshops for practitioners to help them uh, do restoration and, and various um, aspects of making the estuary, uh, not just in Coos Bay, but other estuaries throughout Oregon, um, a better place. Another uh, two organizations that help us learn about the estuary and have done this from time immemorial, um, using what we call, or uh, what is known as traditional ecological knowledge, time immemorial knowledge about understanding the estuary. But they also work uh, with Western scientists, um, researching salmonid and lamprey uh, distributions, um, and they are part of a big monitoring of Coos Bay's water quality. That's the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Rumpa, and Sisal, and the Coquel Indian Tribe. Uh, part participate in this. And the information, if you're interested in water quality um, in Coos Bay, can be easily found because we have, the South Slough has some monitoring stations, as does the Confederated Tribes have a monitoring uh, a station. And you can go on real time to the NANUS, the Northwest Association of Network Ocean Observing Systems, um, to find out Coos uh, Estuary's water temperature, its salinity, oxygen, and other features. Um, so if you want to know what's going on in Coos Bay today, um, you can go to those sites. And here's just one example I pulled off yesterday. This is a, a monitoring station at the BLM boat ramp um, in, on the North Spit. And this is salinity, the amount of salt in the ocean, going from September um, of this year up until t uh, yesterday. And you can tell by this that the salinity has declined, and that's because it's rained. Um, and so there's a lot more fresh water coming down in the bay. Um, but you can follow along in, in real time what is happening in Coos Bay. Uh, and then another large organization that is about to celebrate its 100th anniversary here in Coos Bay next year is the Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Oregon in Charleston. Um, they've conducted extensive research um, on the estuary over the years, um, and they play a very large role in educating undergraduates, graduates, and the public. Here's just some examples of the research that have been conducted at OIMB. Um, the, uh, as you saw, Christine actually showed a little bit of the Coos Estuary hydro hydrodynamic modeling um, of water and sediments in the, in the bay. This is done in conjunction with the National Estuarine Research Reserve, um, and there's some, just some, graph, some uh, ideas, some maps there, uh, just to show you that you know, there's lots of data. We could, we could have a whole two-hour presentation on this uh, modeling. 
Um, OMB was also responsible for doing a fair amount of research on the, the ships that come into the bay, um, particularly looking at the ships that dump their ballast water, um, and in that ballast water there were lots of non-native animals arriving in the Coos estuary. Many of those animals have um, got a toehold in the estuary. We have actually hundreds of non-native animals that have um, been brought by ships and by other mechanisms. Um, and this research was fundamental to uh, providing the, the regulations that the federal government implemented into ballast water. And we now no longer dump our ballast water from ships into the estuary. So our estuary um, is no longer being invaded in that way. We've also done a fair amount of research on Dungeness crab population dynamics in conjunction with the Oregon Dungeness Crab Commission. And then OIB has been very uh, heavily involved in educating about the estuary. Uh, we have a marine biology major, we have about 300 uh, majors who, uh, they spend one entire year here in Coos Bay, uh, living out in Charleston, studying. Um, we have masters and PhD students who uh, spend anywhere from two to six, hopefully no more than that, um, uh, getting their degrees. Uh, we teach an estuarine biology course, and um, we have an internship program where students come throughout the U.S. and live at the, on campus for a period. So we're, we're very much involved in educating about the estuary. And then, of course, we have the public education in our outreach center of the Charleston Marine Life Center, um, which gets a lot of public visitors, has internships. We work with the tribes and work with the K-12 schools. We also have in Coos Bay a number of nonprofit organizations. Um, one of our largest is the Coos Watershed Association, which helps us uh, work together to improve the health of the Coos watershed. Um, they do a lot of watershed monitoring, a lot of habitat restoration associated with, particularly in the upper estuary. They do research and they have a lot of community engagement opportunities. They run the Mayfly Festival as well as many other um, fun outdoor activities. And the organizations that I've mentioned so far um, have, uh, many of them, as well as others, have joined together in something called the Partnership for Coastal Watersheds. This is a collaborative effort to develop locally driven approaches to responsible development and to help prepare us for the climate related changes that we're going to see or that we are already seeing on Oregon's south coast. I don't know how many of you drove 101 on Monday as it was part of, became part of the bay. Um, and the Partnership for Coastal Watersheds has uh, prepared a number of publications um, and has worked to update the maps for the Coos Bay Estuary Management Plan, as you can see here. Um, so they've been very responsible for helping the, the county and the cities um, with the, the, that update that we'll hear more about. The partnership has also produced a number of other uh, publications. This is a, a quite new one, um, the Coos County Estuary Resilience Action Plan. This includes lots of actions to implement nature-based solutions um, that focus on natural infrastructure to help us restore, strengthen, and protect our communities from the impacts of floods, storms, natural hazards, and to improve the and enhance uh, fish and wildlife habitats. So there's lots of good information um, how um, that will ha could happen in this publication as there is in this Coos Bay Climate Hazards Adaptation Plan that was also part of the Partnership for Coastal Watersheds, along with other um, entities. Um, this is an assessment for Coos Bay to better understand uh, adaptation strategies that this, our community could take uh, in response to the climate change hazards that Christine outlined, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and all those things we're gonna have to deal with. Um, as climate change uh, comes to, uh, more severe. 
The another organization, um, the Oregon Fish and Wildlife, uh, they work to research the estuary and also educate about the estuary. We'll hear more about this from Steve, um, but they do a lot of surveys, clam surveys, fish surveys, telling us where is a good place to go um, to recreate. Um, they do a lot of work on salmonids, um, and they do some education. And the Coos Bay Public Schools also has a role in helping us educate about the estuary. If you haven't been to Millicoma Marsh, next to the Millicoma School, you should go, because it's a great place to learn about the estuary, because they have these wonderful poles with information on them that tells you all about different estuarine things, but they also are um, very nicely decorated by the school children from the Millicoma School. Um, and uh, this is a, a place where you can take visitors out of town and they too could learn about the estuary. Something that you may not be familiar with is the Coos Bay Response Cooperative they are responsible for protecting the estuary. Um, they respond to oil spills, um, they train, they have uh, um, drills, they have um, equipment to uh, protect against oil spills. And then there are a number of other nonprofits that educate about the estuary. If you want to know about birds, the Cape Arago Audubon Society is the place to go. They can tell you everything, teach you all about the birds of the estuary. The Surf Rider Foundation, um, which educates and also advocates for the estuary. Surf Rider is dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean. It also includes estuaries um, for all people through a powerful activist network. There's a Coos Bay chapter, they meet regularly, and they sponsor various, various events. This is just one of them. They, sent, they sponsor the Stand Up for the Bay um, to get you out actually exploring the Coos Bay estuary. And then Rogue Climate is another uh, organization, non-profit organization, that educates about the estuary, advocates. Uh, their mission is to empower our community um, to uh, uh, to win climate justice by organizing for clean energy, sustainable jobs, and a healthy environment. Um, they've done a number of things associated with the estuary. They've had youth internships. They've, they've involved in energizing the South Coast, working to assist low-income residents to qualify for heat pumps. And currently, they're helping citizens understand the Coos Bay Estuary Management Plan, which, which is currently under review. Likewise, the Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition um, is doing the same thing with helping to um, get citizens involved in the Coos Bay Estuary Management Plan. Um, Oregon Shores is dedicated to preserving our community, ecosystems, and the landscape of the coasts. Um, they pursue this through education, through advocacy, and engaging citizens to keep watch over and defend the Oregon coast. So if you want to know more, uh, Connect with the organizations I've highlighted, and also check out these that I haven't had time, but, uh, but Steve did a great job with the Coos History Museum. Local libraries have tons of information about the, the um, estuary, SWAP, and the Port of Coos Bay are other, other entities that um, uh, are involved in our estuary.